close Facebook, uh, but for those, uh, Charlotte, if you can, yeah. Uh, for those who are in the room, um, if you wanna stay, uh, we will stay for 45 minutes more um, and initiate a small round table, um, especially focusing on the participation of researchers. So we have invited a couple of researchers from Africa, India, and Latin America to participate. Diego Jr., you are more than welcome to stay. Everybody Thank who you. is in the group are welcome to stay. And uh, it, it's, it's a free brainstorming, it's an informal discussion. Uh, we can also uh, keep discussing some questions that were in the chat. But um, the main objective of this small brainstorming is exactly thinking about you know, the challenges that, that the junior mentioned, Diego mentioned, Kat, Catherine highlight, Judy too, um, and Anthony, how can we bring research closer to practice? No? Uh, we have seen now uh, through COVID, no, after COVID, that um, at least in the health area, science is, is changing. So the scientists, they have to accelerate the process, to change their protocols, and to collaborate much more cross borders, no? um, to, to find a vaccine uh, uh, for COVID, right? That's where, what we are looking for. So we, from the globe, we are looking for a solution to COVID, no? to a vaccine. And we are, we are learning to, to, to work differently. So the question that we want to pose here for this debate is, we urban activists, let's say so, right? Um, we people who understand the importance of, of, of you know, tackling informality, tackling um, Islams, and, and the importance that this, this segment you know, has for contributing to our economic, economic growth, development, social development, etc. cetera. Um, how can we collaborate more intensively? How can research help uh, the Islam upgrading agenda? You know, promote uh, cross-border, and knowledge sharing, promote, um, you know, um, maybe almost lively research, you know, because we all said uh, Latin America has extensive practical knowledge. And I agree. But uh, what I see and what we see is that we haven't been able to capture this knowledge, you know, and, 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 and to replicate this knowledge. So this is fundamental. If we want to replicate these practices to other countries, we have to understand uh, the context, we have to understand the history, and we have to understand the practical knowledge. And, and, and this is actually the key. You know, how can we bring practitioners to the front and how we can make both practitioners and researchers work together in a collaborative way so that research and universities, academic, is able to capture the practical knowledge that is just out there. But if we go and if we continue doing research in, 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 the, in the pace that we did in the past, we'll not be able to do that. So uh, the way um, um, Anthony he was presenting the research, you know, and this workshop being part of this research, you know, and, and collecting what's out there. Um, for me, it's very innovative, you know, and, and, and this is the way to go. We have to basically, you know, go there and, and find and, and dig deeper um, to understand what's going on. But we also have to be uh, fast, you know. So um, this is the major question. Diego? Claudia, sorry, uh, I really need to leave because I have a, another meeting to attend. Thank you so much for, for inviting me and, and, and for sharing this wonderful moment together. And let's hope to see each other again pretty soon. Thank you, Diego. Bye-bye, oh. Junia. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Diego. Yeah, see you next time. We'll... I Bye, have Diego. an appointment too. I didn't know you were going to, to do that, so Don't I'm sorry. I... I can't stay anymore. <laughs> there, will be, there will be certainly many other opportunities. Okay, thank you very much. It was thank a lovely you. experience. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Ciao. Yeah, thank Obrigada. you. Ciao. Obrigada. So, yes. Um, so, I don't know, Judy and Kathy, if you are able to stay a little bit longer. I see Judy on the on the screen. Okay, 
So, uh, so this is the main question that we want to post uh, and start this um, first, you know, free brainstorming with you. But um, I will start with uh, with Anthony. Anthony, maybe you can um, also come up with eventually responses, but also further questions to the to the main dilemma that we posted here. Sure, certainly. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, well, it's it's a little bit in 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 the era I've been trying to push uh, myself for the last uh, two years, and I think a lot of have much more experience. It's like uh, if you really try to 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 make academic research activate for a greater purpose, trying to to work closer with practice, you you encounter plenty of hurdles, and um, it. it it starts with very, very um, different um, perception of times, uh, like how the different sectors work, etc. So, the, the question is really valid, as we have seen under extreme conditions like the COVID-19. Uh, it is possible um, that academia, as a machinery, suddenly is put to a, a larger cost. Obviously, I mean we won't be able to replicate a, a global health crisis, but it's worth asking within the urban field, it's like, how can we really contribute to, to trying to close this theory practice gap? We, most of us, I think also, we, we, we saw it in the motivation of participants. We are trying to push a little bit the boundaries of our uh, silos. So what kind of examples um, um, do you know that actually worked? And eventually linked to that is like, what kind of great challenges do you see in the collaboration uh, between academia and other sectors? Yeah, we don't know. Um, we we don't know each other, uh, everybody. But um, I, I would say um, the ones who want to talk maybe can raise the hand or just. I mute the mic and, and, and present um, him or herself so that we get acquainted to, to each other. I, I see many faces here, Circe, Flavio, Catalina, Margarita, Hector. I'm sure Hector has a lot to say, Stephen, everybody welcome, Diego. Um, yes. Hi. Anna Claudia, it's Judy. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. I was just going to speak. Yeah, I just no, wanted to come in. Briefly, and then sadly, I have to go too. So, just again, wanted to thank thank you for organizing this. And um, I think what you raise is a hugely important point. I mean, you know, we've talked about this so many times. Um, we, I don't, I, I, I completely agree. I think consistently over the years, we really just haven't invested enough in this research. Um, what I, I really love the focus on the practical aspects of upgrading and how it's done because that is what, I mean, I have discussions with our country clients all over the world, literally. I mean, I've worked extensively in LAC, East Asia, South Asia, and now in Africa. So, I, I mean, I've had so many discussions and that is the stuff that people want. Um, Conceptually, I think people get it, not, not always, but, um, you know, at the technical side they do, it's just, you know, always the how to. So I would say that anything we can do to try to, um, through the programs that are being implemented, such as the ones that we heard from today, is to actually document a lot of it. I know that people, um, you know, that that's the hard part often for practitioners. But if we could find a way to to get somebody to do some of that and um, look carefully at some of the uh, processes and um, draw on whatever data we can get, uh, increasingly trying to use um, big data uh, technology uh, so that we can get information on a regular basis and quickly, um, and then use dissemination channels to get the information out there. So um, I just wanted to say, I, I think this is hugely important. And I hope, again, this is something that we can continue to partner on because uh, we, we feel the same. And I think it's an important role that our organizations can play. Thank you. 
wonderful, Judy. Yeah, all many valid points. And I believe the researchers in this room, room mostly from, from the global south, are key in this aspect because they're very close to practice. No? So um, I believe this is a very robust set of, of stakeholders for taking this, this further, yeah. And this is the beginning, no? so we have more collaboration um, in front of us ahead. Thank you, Judy. Wonderful, always wonderful to work with you. Um, yes, I, I don't see any hands. Um, ah, okay, yes. Hector? I think ah, that's I that, but I can, <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for the question. I, I was really struck when I saw the, the question of how to speed up scientific research and incorporate and I was, it's something that I have been, you know, and I'm glad I have been like really thinking about. And in the latest part, I think I'm, I think that we need, in order to speed up scientific research, we need to sl slow down scientific practices. In the sense that uh, we are prone in a process of, of scientific practices that are like related to a specific outputs. And we need to slow down and intertwine our practices with other practices uh, in the city, in the, in, in the territories that we live. So in that sense, I don't think that, I think there is not an opposition or our artic our articulation and to incorporate um, academia or scientific research to practitioners. I think we are practitioners too, we are scientific practitioners. So we, we have, if, if we see scientific research in the sense of, of practice, and I think the question is about how we articulate the dif these different practices. And I was thinking about the examples. And for me, one that I like it very much is the, the one that we have been working with the labs and the UHPH. Um, we have been working since, since 2015. I mean, the, 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 the emergence of the, all, all this process with the, the Stephen and all this articulation, this intertwine between uh, researchers and, and, and other um, actors. And uh, it, it, when COVID came and it was all this question about we need some things, I, I see how the labs were able to, to activate people in order to start working on a really fast way. And I'm thinking about uh, Mercedes and for instance, like uh, with Kata that, that she came on board somehow uh, since last year to start working in the migratory, in the lab for Minurbi and all this question around Sedat. Or, so I think uh, the, the, the experience that we have there is, and then I think we need to extract is that we have been working in this, in this articulation between different uh, researchers and, and other pract practitioners and how we could came together at some point during this, this uh, emergency uh, at the beginning. And uh, so in that sense, I, I will have this, this element. And I think we see this, this, this idea of building networks that can be operate, operate, op operative in a very quick, quick time is with the civil society, what we see also in the Islam, in, in informal settlements, that most of the response has been quick, but from networks that has, uh, have been there before. So in that sense, I, I think that we need to slow down in order to, to really make a really quick uh, processes in which uh, pra scientific practices can uh, integrate or articulate with other um, elements. And I think it's a, a question of how uh, we start building these networks. And one of the, I think one of the, taking one question, one element that Anthony said that one, uh, what are the challenges is that one, we don't know each other, I mean, as uh, different practices. Uh, we need, we have uh, some people we know, but uh, there are a lot of scientific uh, researchers and a lot of practitioners that doesn't know each other. And I think the, the, the challenge is how to start building this articulation and uh, start evolving our mind of saying that scientific knowledge is above all knowledges. I think we need to move uh, towards the idea that scientific knowledge is a specific knowledge that contributes to the composition of, of cities and the world uh, overall, 
but it, it, it should be articulated with other knowledges that come from other practices. And that will be for me too. Thank you, Hector Margarita. Uh, you are even mute Hi. now, yes. Yeah. Hi. It, you. Um, well, I am Margarita Green. I am from Redeus, I'm from Chile. Uh, and we have a long, long experience of uh, what we call them neighborhood upgrading program, but they started up like slum upgrading programs. What happens is that we also had a long experience in Chile of uh, sites and services. So what we did is was we upgraded already some of these that were not, uh, that were let's say, poor neighborhoods. Anyway, what I wanted to say about the, 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 I find this interesting, really interesting, the question that we were talking about, because I think we're all uh, trying to work it out, how to do research and be practitioners at the same time. I'm not sure I agree totally with you, Hector, uh, because I find that time is limiting, really. We, uh, you know, the, the, the practitioner time on site is enormous. You really need, somebody said there that for good participatory programs, you need a lot of presence on site. And I also think that to be, uh, you know, sort of a, a good researcher, you need a lot of time also in reading papers, in writing papers, etc. So what I really think it's, a, although I do believe that researchers have to be in context with reality, I think really that, um, and that you can have some researchers that are practitioners at the same time, and that is absolutely perfect, no, no problem with that. But I also see a, a big role in researchers, scientific researchers, let's say, that what they do is they document and then they analyze experiences from around the world and they try and pick up the factors that are important. And in doing so, they, they sort of find the weak aspects and they find the strong aspects of certain experiences. And they're able to that document it in a journal, for example, that will reach the other end of the world which by a practitioner, that is almost impossible. See, so what I mean is that uh, I think we need all sorts of practitioners and we need all sorts of academic research. Because for example, uh, I think Diego said something that, I mean, Diego said many things that were very good, I found. Uh, but he said also that, um, that you couldn't export an experience from one place to the other because always the sort of local aspects were very particular. I agree totally with that. So what I, I see is that, for example, sometimes an, uh, um, a, a very good practitioner can spend five or 10 years in one experience. He will learn a lot about that area, that local site, et cetera. But that to, to sort of export it to Asia or to Africa has to be conceptualized, has to be compared with other experiences, has to be trying to see what are the aspects that really affect it, et cetera. And that can be very well done by an association with a scientific researcher. And then it can be exported as a sort of paper, let's say, which will be read by a researcher on the other end of the world. And that researcher, if he is also with his feet on the ground, will be able to uh, transmit that to his local reality. So you know what I mean? It's like, a, I'm not saying that it's a better, it's a better or more higher level knowledge. But I do think that there's a, different, um, there's a different analysis that needs to be made. And many times a practitioner doesn't have time to do this abstraction of the reality, nor many times the, the scientific has the time to go down and, and get this sort of local knowledge. So I do think that you need, uh, you cannot sort of mix them completely and forever. They need to exist many times of them, many types of practitioners and many types of researchers. That's it. Mercedes? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mercedes Di Virgilio from Argentina, University of Buenos Aires. And I think we have to, the challenge we have is to uh, make a uh, compare research compare research because a compare research could offer a knowledge a more complex and 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 could uh, offer insight for the practitioners no 
uh, could offer um, more information about how uh, some experience uh, are uh, working in different places, no? And how uh, uh, some features of places, how some feature of territories, some some factor are uh, working in different uh, contexts in different territories. So I think the compare research is. Uh, and extremely important uh, for for uh, for go ahead with uh, housing upgrading. Adriana, hi, uh, Claudia, everyone. Uh, I am Adriana Hurtado from the University of Los Andes in Bogota. Uh, some of the points I wanted to bring were. Uh, were said uh, by Margarita. Uh, I totally agree with her uh, that the role of, of researchers, yes, it has to be uh, like this link uh, for, uh, with both practitioners and policymakers. Uh, we have to respond to the pressing needs of society, of course. But I think the special uh, value that we can add as researchers is this. Uh, link between the the things that uh, are happening in like in real time and broader processes uh, like uh, context uh, to differentiate uh, aspects that we can compare also as as uh, Mercedes uh, said recently um, to distinguish what is structural what is a, uh, what uh, based to the pressing needs of today what is uh, particular to the, this kind of context, what, what can be shared uh, between regions, between countries, I don't know. Uh, but uh, from the presentations uh, of today, I, kept, I kept, keep thinking that we have a challenge that is uh, how to trust, transcend the idea of sharing best practices. You know, that uh, these uh, specific interventions that uh, are very, uh, uh, illustrative of how things can be done. How can we uh, transcend uh, this uh, best practice uh, knowledge sharing to really uh, have an impact, uh, not a, a impact uh, and a research impact, but a policy impact. Uh, because in in Colombian cities, you can see that uh, we have this uh, like punctual specific experiences, like uh, the ones Diego mentioned in Medellin and everything. But yet, uh, mainstream policy is uh, like uh, its focus is in other uh, instances. Uh, while we have slum upgrading in certain specific sites, we have uh, the most of the cities are growing peripherally in uh, great uh, massive social housing projects with lots of problems. Like mainstream policy is uh, going one way and uh, best practices are yet yet to be uh, acknowledged and incorporated really in in practice in in policy making. So I think uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, for researchers is to actually be this link to listen to practitioners to follow the research questions, the the possible solutions, the alternatives that people that solve urban needs in, in, in real life <laughs> and how to contextualize them, compare between regions, and then how to really uh, help uh, policymakers translate them to mainstream practice. That was the thing that I was thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Claudia. Thank you, Adriana. Let's go to Africa. Marie? Thanks, Anna Claudia. I, I thought it would be really useful. Sorry, should I um, turn my yes. thing on? <laughs> um, I thought it would be really useful to go back to your, your very starting words, which was around, um, you know, the things that were in place um, in, in the countries or in the context where these, these two really useful projects that we saw um, um, could unfold, and it, it, it included the legal frameworks, the, the sort of planning standards, the planning framework, and all of that. And I, I really think that um, 
the, you know, our, our academic research um, on its own doesn't have the agency to make um, something like upgrading happening happen. Not in a context um, like South Africa, at least, where the odds are stacked against it. And um, uh, and and so I think it's really important to also try and map who the social bearers are of of some upgrading programs. You know, um, and um, yes, it is. It's the frameworks and it's the legislation, but. It, in South Africa, as Anna Clara, you've been you've been exploring with us. Um, some of our planning frameworks are in place, and 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 yet, um, and our upgrading program has been in place, and the funding mechanism since 2004, and yet the projects aren't unfolding, um, not in anything as exciting as what we're seeing in Latin America, and and so there is something. There's a sort of a, a missing a missing link, and um, whether it's how politicians, you know, uh, yeah, it, it, it might be, you know, at the moment, it's still quite an oppositional thing to try and push for some upgrading, even though it's an, in the minister, the housing minister's budget speech from two days ago, it's included, but it's included as a sort of a, a little side note um, under, under, you know, right at the end, she doesn't, she really doesn't own, own that um, for her, Far more exciting for her is massive housing delivery that will unlock the economy, and and so, and so the messaging around um, slum upgrading is still very marginal to the mainstream, and and so I think it's also about finding out what excited sufficient politicians or whoever needed to make it happen in these places, and I think I, I tried to do a bit of that in my PhD way way back in the late 90s, and I think that's when I perhaps met Anna Claudia for the first time. I did go to Belo Horizonte and Urba, visited them and, and tried to get my head around why it was happening in Brazil and not happening in South Africa. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to unlock it with my research. Um, I'm very kind of humbled by, by how limited our work, our work actually, the impact of our work actually is in the real world. So that's just a, a little comment. Wonderful. Anthony, you want to come in before? Yeah, uh, actually, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I think, um, um, thank you, Marie, also for sharing your view. I mean, wh when it becomes political, it, 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 uh, it's probably the, one of the most um, interesting, but also discouraging uh, elements within this project. I personally, I, my other research I'm doing is actually looking at real estate markets and real estate developers and how they influence policies. So I so, suppose it sheds exactly this kind of light that many of you are aware of because in the end you have to sell um, also the, the successes of intervention etc. I also like the, I think it's good for the debate that we make the distinction because uh, before it was not so there between uh, scientific research and academic research. So when I mean, there are certain um, elements to the academic research that I think um, puts a certain weight on its output I and mean, it's like the, the, the thoroughness of research design, etc., the review of literature and embedding in, in, in the discourse, etc., that um, uh, the more you move to practices, I think there are certain benefits uh, to it. So if you look at the scale of the, and this I wanted to, to throw in also to signalize a little bit more, more, more practical way. If you, if you look at the academics, I mean, uh, one reason it's very difficult to, um, to, to move towards practice is if you look at your employment, if you look at, at what you have to do, there's, there's in, lot of, uh, in a lot of regions, a lot of cultures, there's little space. Some regions do better. I think it's always what I admire about Latin America, that there seems to always be a time budget for trying to work with practice, with civil society, etc. I don't know if it's not to fiddle about it, if it's a contractual reality or just a mindset, but I think that's also one, one way uh, other reasons might, uh, might learn from them. But if you look at reality, often you, you just don't, you have a lot of academic obligations, etc., and you're like um, a, a bound atom. So what I saw personally as a very nice way forward um, to, to see and explore, because you don't often know where uh, an in investigation leads, is try to concentrate on the loose essence, and these are the students. I mean, there's um, within 
within uh, academia, there's a lot of work done, and I think it's increasingly recognized uh, through the development of capstones all over the world, that at the end of their studies, students have an accumulated knowledge. If you, you manage to activate it, they can actually produce um, uh, um, a lot of research relatively quickly. With a thesis is when it's like something for, for six months, and you can also test ideas. And this is what we have been doing at my institute. Uh, personally, I would say rather successful because this, the feedback of the students is great, of the involved institution as well. It's trying to, just like to, to ask the question, so do you have a certain question you would like to, to ask and then try to explore? So what kind of modalities can we think of that, um, that, that there's basically a move towards, towards the center because there's a certain obligation of the academic research, a certain obligation of, of, of practice in their research that uh, makes it very difficult to combine. Obviously, there are consultancies, there are common projects, but if you look um, how how accessible they are and how long they take, and just in my context, I would have to apply for the project, get the funds, and then we're talking about three or four years. I agree with Rita and also with Hector, there's, there's a lot of re investigations you can do in depth, etc. But uh, I'm interested in exactly the, um, because I was coordinating the working package one, where we're trying to establish a certain global overview. So what kind of what can we learn from the best practices? Being critical about best practices, but somehow you have to enter. So, and uh, this this connects very nicely to uh, to the comment from uh, uh, from the World Bank. Uh, was it Casey? I'm, I'm very bad in names. We said like. Uh, we we often um, we have a problem of of failures because we we have the tendency of hiding them and uh, I'm agreeing fully that we can learn much much more from failures than from successes but it also means that there are a lot of full semi failures or not so great projects that are still basically circulating as like this works rather well so you you have to to separate like the the, the the real good practices for this project now, and 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 that's why I, I was looking to a way where we could do a um, quick and dirty approach where we could look into those projects, and once you have them, have a closer look because um, they, they, they they the closer you get, you will learn more and more. But for establishing this overview, I think this is the the greatest challenge: this kind of trying to enable the um, um, transnational learning experiences. There are more and more platforms trying to do that. Uh, but they are often on their own, and that's why I think academia, particularly in this kind of uh, knowledge platform like the UHPH and, and others, you can try to, to, this is at least uh, my conviction, try to dock in and try to, to, to do some, some, some smaller research projects with the inclusion of uh, students. So I'm just curious about how the, the rest of the audience, because we come from different cultures and from backgrounds, but also in different stages of our career, what they, what they think about, about these elements. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. There are so many hands raised, but I really would like to go to the Indians now. I would jump a little bit. Sorry, my colleagues from, from, from LAC, and I see also you, Asad, from the Caribbean, a different perspective. But let's move a little bit to India and listen to maybe Celine and Aparna. Celine? Well, thank you, Anna. Uh, do your no. face. No. Oh. <laughs> I can show you my face. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so... Since we're talking about affordable housing, uh, I think it's important that uh, Latin America, as we are celebrating Latin America and all its experience and all its history in affordable housing, it would be really great if you're able to actually uh, to make a little, you know, like a list of innovative or affordable housing projects that has worked for very poor communities. And especially for the bottom 20%, like waste pickers, like street vendors, you know, you know, like that informal economy that's even bottom than the bottom. So you, first of all, we know that you cannot generalize about affordable housing and that there are categories of the urban poor. So how do we do that? And the second thing is, I think the COVID is showing us along with the ecosystems of our planet that we need to design and, you know, differently. We need to go to our planning table and do it differently. And, and one of the things that we need to be very cognizant of, that if we need our future generations to be able to enjoy what we have enjoyed, we really need to be able to create sustainable solutions while being affordable. So, 
So I think to the housing professionals around this table and in this room, that is something that we really need to do our homework on because you know we can talk till the cows come home, but if we don't have real examples to show to our city governments, they will continue to construct and do business the old way. So we need to bring in that innovation. Thank, Thank you. you. Aparna, before you go to bed. Aparna? Is she, is she there or she left? No, Aparna? No, I'm, I'm, I'm 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 yeah. <laughs> it's super late, right? So go ahead. <laughs> I'm uh, still awake and um, uh, I must say that uh, the super bug has disrupted our life. Uh, in a way that uh, people who are internet connected, they are working now 24 seven because we are now working on uh, different zones, no? So that's very, um, if there is an excitement, there's an adrenaline rush. Um, and also I think I feel more connected actually. This is something that is uh, weird because in this time of uh, crisis, one is more uh, connected globally than before. Was this kind of event we could have done before also, because we also had internet at that time. But then, at, you know, we never had this urge to connect with you know. So only when we traveled, then we connected. Otherwise, this is like a forced, uh, you know, something has happened in our uh, system that we are now connecting. Um, what I wanted to share with you that, you know, I work for GIZ in India office. And uh, we have been uh, struggling to figure out that in India, we also have implemented in-situ upgrading. It's not that it hasn't happened. Uh, it has happened uh, with, um, with the funding from donor agencies, mostly. And also it has happened uh, taking housing as the entry point. You know, always like uh, the logic is that you have to uh, upgrade the housing and then um, basic services and then the quality of life would become better. So that was, that is the logic. Um, but then, Selena, correct me, I have been trying to figure out where is that one place where all these experiences are documented. Uh, so in India, when we talk to people, then we find out that, okay, uh, someone has worked on such project or someone has uh, done that one or some one paper is existing somewhere but there is no um, consolidated knowledge on that. And also there is uh, no um, course on that, you know, in the planning school. Like in the housing seminar, if I want to take a course on that, on a module on that, that is also not available. So this is what I felt as a gap uh, at GIZ. We felt this is a gap and uh, we have taken up very nascent or I would say a very first baby step and where we said, okay, let us at least do the documentation and uh, for the India case study. And while we were doing it, uh, we are also now getting connected to many networks. And I would say that uh, partly it is uh, the practitioner's problem because we are not connected to all the researchers who are doing this research and keeping it to themselves or in the international journals, uh, which uh, I think in, in our daily work, we are not accessing. And um, the researchers are also not kind of, you know, connecting with us where we have a lot of uh, nuanced uh, experiences on that. So I really like this, uh, like this discussion that is going on that, you know, how do you bridge this uh, connect? Because this is where I think the energy lies. If one can uh, leverage on that, then I think a lot of things can be, uh, you know, we can really progress much more faster because uh, I know many of my colleagues uh, uh, are working in, in the ground situation and there is so much of learning there, but they don't get the time to write it down or to document it. And that's where I think uh, maybe some uh, focus should be done. Um, from India experience, I would like to bring one point here is that way back in 2001, when I was studying in UCL, I did uh, my master's uh, dissertation on uh, how slum upgrading influences the rental uh, population. So what happens when you implement a slum upgrading program in a, in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in a settlement where you have people living on uh, rental arrangement? After so many years, I'm still struggling to figure it out that in the public policy, 
do in india do we have that as a consideration that most urban poor are not living on ownership housing they are living on rent um, there is a census data there are empirical studies this has been uh, established quite um, with lot of facts and figure but the housing policy in india continues to focus on self ownership and this uh, land uh, tenure regularization uh, that doesn't come to an extent but i would say still there is a, a kind of an understanding that they live on their own ownership or they want to or they aspire to buy their own which is not true they live on rental and what happens when you do instead of some upgrading you invest in the public infrastructure how does that impact them is something that i find uh, a still a knowledge gap and uh, we are trying to figure that out another concept that i wrote in the chat and i just would like to know how the uh, researchers react to it that why are we always entering from the uh, from the um, you know housing point because slums in the cities are mostly employment generation they are the economic hubs actually they are the one who are doing certain kind of a economic activity so if we invest in that economic activity then the housing would happen on its own so i'm just wondering that you know in the in situ upgrading if we flip it that in a in a in a city you have to invest in say special uh, economic zone which is in a informal area if you take that approach what happens and with that you do the upgrading and then the housing comes with the private investment uh, i am i'm kind of toying with this idea because i'm working in the in a, a jute mills dyeing jute mills in west bengal and i'm finding that you know these are economic hubs these are special areas and it has a particular kind of a economic activity so how would it be different you know if we do upgrading of those areas and not uh, enter it from the housing and services upgrading uh, these are some of my thoughts uh, i just thought i would share with you all thank you for this opportunity thank you a lot aparna uh, and also for staying long uh, so late so le let's go to the caribbean maybe a, a different uh, perspective asad are you still there yes i am and then nakia Go ahead. Okay. We can see you. Um, yeah, I, I have participated in this discussion over the years, Anna, in various networks. And I, I think it's a serious question. And I think that there are, there are a, point, a set of points that have been raised that are useful to raise again. The first one is I think there's a separation, as Anthony usefully said, between scientific research and academic research. Um, and it, it normally two different set of objectives and incentives and outcomes of either one. So in academic research, uh, I, I tend to disagree that if one focus on writing journal articles that you have too much impact because the audience and who reads it and the format of presentation um, limits its suitability and accessibility to practitioners and policy makers. And therefore I think we need to create parallel and separate communication and mechanisms and uh, formats for the preparation of information and data to make it more accessible as one. And in my own experience, we, we have in the academic world where I've spent most of my life, people who make a choice to progress, which is quantity of journal articles, grade of journal articles, and those who make a choice to do socially relevant research there one is not as well viewed in the world of academia as another one so that's one particular problem the the second thing is that academic research tend not tends not to be formatted in structures and that has been raised maybe we need formats templates that allows us to do more meaningful comparative research in categories around land uh, infrastructure building improvements, uh, participation, and so on. And uh, Apna made a very important point that I was, I was, I reflected on something. I was very lucky many years ago 
for Habitat 2 before Habitat 2 in the preparatory process to visit Daravi, which is at that time a very well researched slum in, in Mumbai. And it was very clear to me that Mumbai had a very high percentage of self employment in Mumbai, even though they weren't dealing with their solid waste problems very well. And some of the the, the, include the incisions into Mumbai to build high-rise towers were not successful because it disconnected people from the economic activity and network at the level of the ground where they generated all this employment. So they resolved the quality of housing shelter units, but they disconnected people from the economic networks. And therefore, as practitioners, when you get involved in, um, in issues of uh, codifying and seeing what practices are useful, the various elements are very different from when you approach it from an academic point of view. So uh, I have been participating in UHPH and I've also participated in the Habitat International Coalition many years ago, which also tried to link practice. I participate in the, the International Land Coalition and I find that the types of research collaboration and networks are when you combine academics with practitioners and policymakers and civil society. How to make those networks work and how to codify the research, I think, is one of the questions we need to ask. I have a lot more to say, but I'll stop with that. Thank you, Asad. Nakia from Jamaica. Oh, I'm frozen. Okay. Oh, you're there. Go ahead. Hi, can you, you can, can you hear me and see me? Yes, please introduce yourself. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on, my phone is... It is well, not here. It's good? All right, yes. so I've got you, I can see it now. Hi, um, so my name is Nakia McMorris. I'm from Jamaica. And um, so I am not an academic, right? but I am into combining the two. I used to work in the US where I think they had good research in, in some housing policies, but as I returned to Jamaica after living there for a while and doing housing, one of the issues that I come up with, and I've been talking to Anna Claudia about this, and I just haven't seen or heard any research on it because I think a big push that I find that a lot of people speak about is these high rises, and I think, I think that gentleman, I think he's from Trinidad, had mentioned, like, for instance, what happened in India with, with the stacking or the towers that were erected. It really didn't work well for a lot of the communities. However, I'm finding that that is still being pushed um, internationally. But what I know is that locally in Jamaica, that does not work. We've tried it in different ways. And I think we're having a problem similar to what is happening in South Africa, where um, the policy is not. The housing policies are really being pushed progressively and in addition um, it's done more from a political platform versus actually integrating it and so we're left here kind of just pulling things from different sides but one of the things that comes up for us all the time is that though identification is being pushed it just doesn't work here um, and i know as a social worker that if you tend to pile people on top of each other then you lose that human element of interaction. But at the same time, I know we don't have enough land and we can't build individual houses. So I'd love to see a little bit more research. And I mean, I know Jamaica is like a drop in the bucket compared to where some of you are, but um, how to address identification in a way that can allow for social integration and at the same time, allow people to build their families in a stable way, because we haven't been able to come up with a good idea here. And um, I, I just keep retreating to that. We need to either just do two, two layers of housing or we just need an individual house. And I don't think that works anymore. Um, so I'd just love to hear that at some point from you guys because I do participate in these activities, thanks to Anna Claudia, but I just haven't found anything that really suits the Caribbean in a good way. And maybe we need to come up with it, but I'd love to hear the be best practices as to how to address some of these. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, then we 
We cannot hear you, Stephen. You are on mute. There, there we go. There. <laughs> Where is that mute, mute button? Um, great to see everybody, and thank you for this um, convening, Anna Claudia, and everybody who's joined us. Um, I just want to pick up on uh, a point that Assad was making just a moment ago uh, about the the coalescing of uh, academics with practitioners and uh, private sector, public sector. I mean, the, the Urban Housing Practitioners Hub, which a number of you in Latin America are engaged in and, and have uh, been active with, had, was very explicitly intentional about making sure academics and research was part of the networking process. Um, in part, and, and largely because the recognition of the sharing and transfer and the curation of knowledge is so important to this, to this, um, to, you know, to this process, to the improvement of the quality of the practice that's taking place in, in cities, um, not just in the LAC region, but around the world. And I guess my comment today would be that um, I, I, I think the, the time, what's, what's different now is that the technology and the phenomenon of COVID-19, which is forcing us all to be virtually connected in ways that even a few months ago, we weren't really utilizing as much. It's putting a great deal of demand on and pressure on how that knowledge gets managed and curated and disseminated and, and used uh, to improve the quality of practice going forward. The housing labs that, that, um, that we facilitate um, you know, as part of the Urban Housing Practitioners Hub are, are, are a way of kind of harnessing uh, experience and knowledge and applying it to, to particular uh, situations. Uh, but beyond that, the, the ability of, of this abundance of information and knowledge that we have to be managed and accessible and usable in a nimble fashion, as Hector was talking about earlier, you know, how can we kind of slow down in order to find the, the best ideas that we can uh, respond to. That's how I interpret it, Hector, your comments. Um, and, and find, the, find the, the information that we can, that is most useful to improving the quality of our practice. The, the demand on our management of knowledge is, is really high. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about how much knowledge and how much appetite there is for connecting and dialogue. Uh, the challenge is how do we manage it efficiently uh, without burning everybody out in the process. So um, I just, I really appreciate uh, the, the first part of our dialogue with, uh, with the examples from uh, Brazil and Argentina. And this dialogue is, is terrific as well. And there's wonderful content in the chat. If you haven't uh, had a chance to scroll through the chat, there's great, great comments there. So anyway, thank you for this opportunity to be with you all. Thank you, Stephen. So let's go back to Africa. And I'm sorry, everybody's waiting to talk. Uh, Diana from Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, my name is Diana Washira. I'm from Pamoja Trust, a civil society organization in Kenya. And um, I'm loving the conversation, especially because for Pamoja Trust, um, the matter of uh, relating um, planning, um, policy work with data and evidence has been very key and something that we have been following up on. Um, over time, time and practice in Kenya has shown that um, policy has not been reflective of the data that is there. And this has resulted to a lot of consequences, especially for the urban poor. We've had dispossessions, we have exclusion and what have you. So what we have done um, to really bring all stakeholders to the table is that we've had uh, a lot of consultative multi-stakeholder engagements uh, where we have the practitioners, we have the government present, we have the academia, we have the civil society, and most importantly, we have the local communities. This has resulted into a stakeholder engagement framework that really guides then how um, these stakeholders um, integrate and engage in, 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 uh, in whatever instance, be it infrastructure, be it housing, and what have you. I think Kenya has had a lot of um, lessons learned from uh, this, lack of um, engagement between stakeholders and, and use of data because most of our upgrading processes have not been as successful because of the of the of that lack of integration of all these stakeholders so then this platform has had um, so far good results uh, because then we have the uh, a, a 
part of the government body uh, that manages infrastructure, that is the Kenya um, Highways Authority, really implement it so that what they're doing currently is that um, in, in a certain project that they have, they have built a market that integrates with the road infrastructure. So that is the kind of uh, conversation we are having. And even in social planning uh, processes, we have been uh, doing the same. So that then our, the academia, the universities that uh, deal with planning are able to real time engage students on what is happening, on the best practices that um, are happening uh, globally, on the new and innovative tools like the social tenure domain model that we at Pamoja Trust implement. So then this framework has uh, brought a table if I may say so, that each stakeholder has a seat in. It's something that it's new, it's something that we want to upscale so that then all uh, policies are reflective of the evidence that is there. We actually call it um, evidence-led policy and planning work. Thank you. But I think this conversation is interesting and would, I'd would like to see where it takes us, even at the global scale. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, for staying so late too. So let's go to Catalina because she's been also waiting a long time. She's Colombian based in London. Catalina, and then Brazilians, I come back to you. I know it's <laughs> less time here. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Catalina Ortiz. As Anna said, I'm Colombian, but based in London. I work in the Development Planning Unit and particularly I've been doing research on how we can learn about Islam operating practices, but going beyond and questioning the idea of best practices precisely and trying to push and contest what are the other alternatives, uh, ways of learning and particularly understanding translocal learning, right? How is the circulation of the stories? What do we need really to learn in order to, to grasp what are the principles, the framework and the enabling conditions uh, for the things to happen, right? Um, but I think I, this question that is, is very provocative in terms of the speed also made me question like more broader, <laughs> bigger questions, if you will. What is then uh, even the social function of universities and how we need, really need to be thinking and realigning in how we actually deliver an impact and really what gets value in academia uh, in very corporate environments that universities have become. As you rightly said, many of the times we are only measure, and I say it for, for my experience, uh, based on all those papers published, but in reality, the true work that does make an impact on the ground is the one that takes long, is the one that doesn't really show up or have any recognition at any institutional level. So there's a very big disconnect between what gets value in the institutional environment of academia and what the world need, really needs in terms to pursue or to push for transformational change. And pushing for agendas of uh, spatial justice and social justice really needs to put together very well-crafted alliances and I think in my department and the things that we try to do is always to having in mind at least two premises. One is the um, partnerships with equivalence. So we cannot do anything if it's not connected to the real world problems with actors on the ground. And I think what we've been doing is precisely connecting with all the networks and different stakeholders as an integral part of how we ambition the production of knowledge. But connecting back to what uh, Hector was saying at the beginning, we understand knowledge in plural. And when we talk about research, in my case, we are thinking more in the co-production of knowledge. When you take a perspective of co-production, then it's a very different ground. And therefore, how is measured in terms of outcomes uh, is a very, different, a, a very different outlook. And of course, uh, I'm in a privileged uh, Global North institution. And of course, there's a very big and problematic asymmetry in terms of access to funding, for instance, and what is the funding that is accessible and what are the agendas of the funding uh, bodies that, for instance, in the UK has and now with the merge with uh, the very little uh, regard for international development is, having, is gonna be having a very big impact in what we do. Of course, there's a geopolitics embedded there, but we cannot really forget when we are thinking in how to even have equitable partnerships to deliver what is needed. So I think uh, partly of what I think some of, of you have said already about the, the division of labor and that we, have, we need different researchers and different type of practitioners, I think this is a very crucial moment with really need to align and synchronize um, agendas 
And many of the times, the only way to do it is actually pushing in the, whoever is funding research, but also questioning to, to what extent building these different bridges across organizations and how can even uh, uh, practitioners and academics need to unlearn and trying to think how to really create impact together. And I think we still have a very long way to go. And um, that's why I'm committed to develop very different methodologies for actually really engaging with every level and the strategies and typologies of knowledge in order to further particular um, agenda such as the one of Islam upgrading. And I'm very happy to keep discussing this because as you know, I'm very passionate about, about this question. Brilliant. Circe, you have been waiting long and then Flavio, the resilience. Hi. Hi. Oh, I'm very pleased to be in this conversation. I'm really excited with all the, the, the people talking about different things. And I, I would like to spice up a little bit uh, with another... Let me see. Considering the academia and the scientific knowledge uh, regarding these, these issues, I think that we need a lot of innovation, not only in the process and communication, but in the way we are thinking. And one thing that I think is lacking in this equation is the participation of other uh, uh, disciplines and fields of knowledge. When you, we talk about university, it's a lot of knowledge that should be coming together you see and I see all this discussion on housing very much uh, being done by architects, urbanists, sociologists and in our experiences working as a university uh, in a joint project with the local government and engaging populations we brought economists, biologists, psychologists, all of them in order to understand uh, what kind of solution we should give for for any 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 problem, and that uh, brought a lot of innovation and different ways to think, to understand, and to deal with that. Uh, another thing that I think that we we have a huge lack of uh, evaluation of all this this experience. I'm really very much um, disappointed because when I see this experience, they are not very, as a product, as a space, they are not very different of what we have been doing in the 70s. What we learn in, in all these years, what we, we are really achieving. And I think that uh, we are missing to tackle the most important thing uh, that is what make people lives better and that also very much related with the problem of replicability and scalability we are following all these uh, best practices of UN habitat we have prizes every year for slum upgrading housing programs and we see how difficult it is to replicate even in our in the same country Okay, the contests are different, everything is different. But at the same time, when you see, I made a, a lot of re research on domestic space and habits. And all with this problem and different contests, the way a family lives, what make them happy, what make they improve their lives, how they use their houses, the spaces, the neighborhood. Even if you see in China, Korea, Brazil, there is a lot of similarity because we are dealing with, with people, women, with human beings, and we are not addressing that. Uh, we see all this, this experience on housing, but we like to see how they truly improve the life of these people, how living in that house make me have a better life for me and my children in the present and in the future. We're not uh, really looking at that. I think that if we make this link, it will be easier to understand what kind of things are more related to uh, uh, happiness, to a better quality of life. And 
some spice I'd like to I'd like to talk so much at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. You forgot to introduce yourself, or I didn't mention it. Oh, 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 I am Silvia Monteiro, coordinator research lab at University of Pernambuco. It calls in city research and solution for cities. Great. Uh, yes, Margarita. <laughs> yes. That's what She's I wanted to say the, right now. <laughs> So, and I think Flavio, Flavio is also from Recife. Flavio, can you come in and introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Um, hi. Nice for those of you who have survived. <laughs> and thank you for the great, great opportunity. And Cici also works with me. Um, we work at, also at Lattice. So we, <laughs> we work at the same university. Yes, multidimensional, multitask person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it's wonderful that we are still talking about affordable housing. Um, this has been an issue that has been tried to be overcome for decades. And unfortunately, what you have produced is not so affordable, nor it is so good quality, unfortunately. And for example, COVID-19 is just showing us how we can, and not, exactly how we can, but how we should change our perspectives. The response for COVID-19 is the lockdown, wash your hands and have good internet communication. We are talking about e-jobs, uh, shopping online, putting pressure on people's initiative. And if we are talking about people who live in slums and favelas, can you imagine there's 10, 12 people living in a 19 square meter house that crowded with almost non-existent services. How can you tell them, be locked down, wash your hands and do everything through internet? So good quality housing and affordable has never been so urgent. Um, it's really good that this is the theme again but this is the main thing right now coincidentally not with this pandemic and of course it's not a coincidence it's on purpose but i think that also going back to the main issues which is the connection and the communications between research and practitioners i remember when i was doing my master's degree in urban design with nabil hamdi at Brooks University, that there was this huge conference on bridging the gap. We still have this gap. It's amazing. Practitioners don't read journals. Academics don't talk to practitioners, nor to politicians, apparently. What, what, why are we doing so wrong? I mean, I'm an academic. Maybe I don't talk too much with politicians. Maybe I avoid working with politicians because I don't want my research being overlapped with pol politics. I don't know, to be honest, but this kind of channel that we are doing now is amazing. But I don't know how powerful it can be to influence policies locally. Those two cases that we, we solve, um, they are nice to be put as best practices, but to be honest, I, I, I agree with CC. And what, what's the difference between what we saw and what we had experienced in the past decades? And to be honest, even more honest that we all shall be, the case of Bisha 31, and it's now called Barrio 31 to be more fancy, is a disaster. They destroy the tissue, the urban fabric. They put people living in those very nice housings, but they're almost like cardboard. And they are built in the, in the, using technology that they can be dismantled and built somewhere else. Does it mean anything? Does it say that in the future, when they need to replace the people that live there, they will dismantle the houses and build somewhere else? 
trading free uh, trading trading airspace it's liberalism it, it's putting land into market asking three times tax for those who can come in is really saying that just the better off can come in and the neighborhood is the land values are so high that those who really can afford can pay three times taxes that's charged there because it's cheap. And giving a lease of 30 years for those who already own their houses, I can't see this as a best practice at all. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm not so positive about this, but perhaps we could try to think about things positively and negatively too, not only best practices. Because best practice by per se is something that will have to be shown as best. So definitely, yeah, we need to reconnect with those who die in practice, but we can't really forget those who are we talking about here, which is those who really live in these houses. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Very important reflections. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you about the best practices, no? uh, but I, I do believe, and this would be my final take before I hand over to, to Anthony to close, and I believe everybody spoke, right? Nobody's missing, because I don't want to have anybody upset with me. Because what I believe, what's key here is to understand the trajectories from the different countries, the different cities, right? And how these practices got there. And also um, how we really, you know, incorporate practical knowledge, no, or support the transfer of practical knowledge. So the practical knowledge, which entails, you know, experience, wisdom, um, everything, failures, no, um, championings. Uh, this is for me what's critical. No? So how to channel the practical knowledge and, and get the knowledge out of those people who are on a daily basis engaged on 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 this practices, uh, being them community leaders, no, most especially the grassroots organizations, the social sector, um, the local governments, the private, even the private sector, etc. No? So how can we extract this knowledge and how can we use that to build a critical mass no? and a collaborative effort to really, you know, support those who are politically willing to change because they are out there. Uh, from, from different sectors, right? And and I uh, do agree with um, who put here, I think Adriana uh, or Catalina, that the academia is a, is a political stakeholder as the civil society is a political stakeholder. So when I mean political will, I, I don't only mean necessarily um, the politicians, I mean our uh, society having political will because the fact that uh, we elect uh, these presidents that are out there right here in Brazil, where we are in different cities and countries, means that the civil society had this political will. So this is where we have to up, act up on to. And I do agree that uh, maybe we have to find spaces and the laboratories have, have been an interesting space to connect technical knowledge and practical experience to political stakeholders, being them from the different sectors. No? Uh, but I think I, we would love to, to keep talking. Uh, the Cities Alliance will keep supporting these this exchanges. We'll, you'll all be called for, for next exchanges very, very soon. We already have many fre frequent flyers, but uh, Anthony, you are, you are the, the lead uh, of this workshop. Um, your idea, your <clears throat> engagement, so the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, everyone, for sharing their thoughts. It was highly interesting. I, I, I love the roundtable uh, discussion. I like very much the webinar. And it's exactly these kind of critical uh, thoughts like Flavio was raising that are important. I, it's the indication of best practices, like good practices, like, because it's a relative term. You said it's the best that we have. And there might be, there might be good in something, but there, there might be always flaws. And I'm really convinced, like everyone who has, I think, a certain experiences in the, in the field, uh, if you if you dig deep enough, if you look closer, there will be always things that didn't work, etc. And it's very difficult within the discourses of um, of the best practice actually to 
to identify uh, what works, what, what didn't so work, because there's a certain also a politics of knowledge uh, distribution. That's why this collaboration, I think, are very much important because what it, I can only talk for, for the institute I'm working with, so we are trying like to, to get a certain, certain overview and then um, um, identify okay which are the cases to to have a closer to have a closer look. So that there will be always certain certain practices where we see, yeah, okay, they work very well in an economic, political way, but they, they were very uh, detrimental, for example, for this uh, local population. And I'm, I think the the practices that we will be able to identify with the workflow, there, everyone will ha will have certain downsides and upsides. But the challenge is, like, to have to develop a certain research framework that we can try to look at the important elements because um, this is like, I see this as a knowledge project that we are currently involved with as a communicative interface that on the one hand, the practitioners could uh, pick, uh, pick it up and the other one, uh, the, um, the academics could uh, connect to it by doing uh, more profound research because uh, time and resources are always limited. Um, yeah, it's kind of impossible to, to wrap up this kind of discussion. We um, we went through the fortunate uh, step and additional work to have a registration process uh, linked to this uh, event. So we have uh, a lot of emails. Uh, we, we, we stated the interest to be contacted, et cetera, and updated. So we will disseminate uh, the work. We will invite everyone uh, to become uh, uh, part of it. So everyone uh, I will send uh, an email. I would be very interested to to, to to hear the expert view, like this is a good practice, this is not, etc. And uh, as Anna said, it uh, this is a conversation I think that will uh, that will continue also in other formats. I'm very happy on the personal note to have now met a lot of names that I've been following in the research, etc. Like Flavio yourself, etc. And uh, a lot of I already know, uh, but it's always uh, great that this community grows. And uh, thank you for your time. I would close it like this.